Yeah, yeah, I know. I have to sit here. I don't know what I'm doing. It's like uh, Barnet is known as Well Health, Well, Well House Trust. Everyone says, what, "What's Well Health?" It's a Barnet Hospital. I know Well House. <laughs> Okay, everyone, we're, we're going to start um, a few more stragglers making their way through, but I think we'll start because um, we've got a lot to get through in the final session. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you've um, enjoyed your uh, workshops, and certainly this morning's session was, uh, I thought, excellent, and lots of food for thought. This uh, final session, we're going to mix it up a little bit. We've got two speakers for you who I'll introduce uh, in a minute. And then we're going to move uh, seamlessly into a sort of panel uh, discussion with questions uh, from the audience as well as the uh, people who are watching it online, the e-delegates, e um, who I said before, you know, are quite amazing. Uh, I've been doing a few conferences lately where, uh, you know, you've got 200 people in the audience, then you've got 200 more people uh, watching it across the world uh, uh, on the internet, which I think is amazing. Uh, so our panelists... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll join the speakers. Now, the two panelists we've got uh, on, my, on my left, I'll just quickly introduce them so we don't have long, prolonged introductions. Uh, on my left here is Michael Wood, who is the uh, NHS uh, European Office's representative in the UK, who's got the job, I think, of making sure that uh, 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 the work of Brussels office is aligned with the NHS agenda, challenging, challenging no doubt. And then uh, sitting next to uh, Michael, we have uh, Ram Dillon from Middlesex University, who's a consultant ENT surgeon at the London Northwest uh, Hospitals NHS Trust, who's brought his injury with him for, uh, for, for display, but apparently not too serious, I go. No, no, yeah, no good, good. Along. He can hop along. Um, but before we get there, we're going to have uh, two presentations for you. Um, the first will be from uh, uh, Saffron uh, Caudry the end there, who uh, it was the Director of Policy and Strategy at the NHS Providers, uh, the, the membership body that I think most of, you, most of you are aware of, Trade Association for Foundation and NHS Trusts. And Saffron will talk about the challenges of implementing policy in the UK. And then we've got a slight change to the program, uh, but a good one. Uh, Abigail Jacquard on my right is now replacing uh, Charles Alicia, who unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, Abigail's from the UK's uh, Public Health Forum, and she's going to talk about developing and measuring uh, uh, policy. Uh, and as I say, once those two have, uh, have given their presentations, we're going to join us here, and then we'll have a, a more open discussion. Um, do you want to kick us off? Uh, please. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, just say a little bit about myself. As Paul said, I am Director of Policy and Strategy at NHS Providers. Um, before that, I headed up the public affairs team at the Local Government Association. And before that, I was involved in advocacy on behalf of local government in Europe. So it feels like all of my experience is suddenly coming together today, and I never thought it would. So nice opportunity to perhaps <laughs> use some of that. Um, 
I'm going to, yeah, good. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my organisation just to give you a bit of background about what we do. So, as Paul said, we're the membership body and trade association for NHS trusts and foundation trusts in England. We represent 95% of those. We have all types of services in our membership, so acute, integrated, specialist, community, mental health and ambulance. And although we don't have a, a regional representative structure within our organisation, we do have members across all of the regions in England. Our members employ nearly um, a million staff, have a combined turnover of 70 billion, and provide care free at the point of use for 53 million people. The role of NHS providers essentially focuses on three things. It's really influencing the external environment in which our members, so hospitals, mental health trust, community services operate. It's about giving voice to their issues and concerns and what they do. And it's also providing the support and development that they need to do their roles effectively. So what I'm going to talk about today is the challenges of implementing policy to be effective in the UK. It's quite a big and grand title and I did kind of, when I was writing the presentation, I thought, how am I actually going to get into this? And I started to think quite a lot about policy and what I thought about policy. And fundamentally, I came up with this, is that I actually love policy. And I don't think there, maybe there are people on this panel who will say they love policy, but really it's actually about, I love good policy. Um, you know, this is where you get to see my, my kind of nerdy, techie, geeky side, but I genuinely do love good policy. It, it really is a touchstone for whatever we're working on, it is a touchstone to refer back to, to check where we're headed, to guide us on the next steps, to refine what we're doing, you know, it is a sense of course correction, if nothing else. And I think, given the complex operating environments that we all operate in and work in, that is really, really fundamental. So whether it's small scale policy or whether it's major UK, England, UK wide, European, UN policy, good policy is absolutely fundamental. And um, implementing that policy, how it's implemented matters as much as what the policy is. So I suppose just to give you a flavour of what I think good policy is. This isn't exhaustive, of course, um, but these are just some of the elements that I think really, really matter in terms of, of good policy. So I think good policy has to be the shared articulation of a challenge or a problem and then the solution. It has to provide really clear direction and it has to give and set out that common framework and standards by which everyone will operate. I mean, obviously it depends on the nature of the policy. It might be something that's used in a locality or it might be something which is actually a piece of legislation. But whatever it is, I think that those elements are fundamental. And if, if a piece of policy isn't timely and evidence-based, you can guarantee that somewhere down the line it will fall apart. Because if you're implementing something that was a really great idea four years ago, it won't be a great idea now and it won't be fit for purpose and it won't be meeting the needs of the people it's intended to support. To that end, I think that any good policy needs to be developed in conjunction with those implementing it. And by extension, those implementing it need to have developed that policy along with those who will be the receivers or the end users of that policy. And in terms of the final kind of building block for me in terms of um, good policy is that really need to be plans for evaluation of that policy, for updating that policy and for thinking about what the feedback loop is so that you can refine it. So those are just some building blocks of what I think good policy is and good policy development. I'm all up for challenge, of course. I'm happy for you to say this is a load of rubbish and you know my experience is X, Y, and Z. But from my perspective, looking at both UK policy development and European policy development, it, it, it's become clear to me that unless we start to you know, really reflect some of these issues, policy that isn't evidence-based genuinely does start to wither and die pretty quickly. Um, 
one of the things that I was asked to talk about really was was you know how how do we implement how do we implement policy to make it effective, and I'm I'm going to talk through in a little bit of detail here the influences and challenges of both implementing policy nationally and then move on to think about what it means locally because policies obviously operate at a number of levels and um, implementing policy is never plain sailing there are this whole host of influences and challenges and I think that overcoming them depends firstly on having developed it effectively in the first place but if we just canter through these um, kind of different elements I think that one of the big influences and challenges on, on national policy development has to be the, the political element. I mean, it's kind of the starting point and the end point. It doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily a detractor, but it, it's something which will instantly um, claim either supporters or, um, or um, non-supporters, can't think of the word suddenly, um, of, of that policy. So, you know, things that have a ph philosophical and ideological underpinning have some real challenges to them, but they are the starting point. We live in a de democracy and democracy is made up of people who are philosophically and ideologically driven and that is what makes our, our um, democracy very vibrant. And so it's not something that, that we should seek to eliminate, but it's something that we need to work out how, how do we actually work with that. And um, I think that depending on where we are in the political cycle depends how much you know, particular policies are going to be challenged. So my next element really is about the, the parliamentary challenges and influences. So you know, we've got this five yearly term of parliament, um, effective implementation or effective development and implementation of policy can really depend sometimes on whether there's a big government majority or a small government majority because it would depend on how, how that makes its way through parliament. And I think it's safe to say that usually in the first half of, of a parliamentary term is when you see the boldest, the boldest policies being developed and rolled out. I'm not sure we're seeing that quite so much at the moment because I think that things like the, all of the Brexit debates and things like that have, have kind of pulled back on, on some of the bolder um, policies and pieces of legislation we might have seen pushed through in the first part of this parliament. But generally, parliamentary cycles and the level of majority do have a big influence both on, on developing policies but also on how they are implemented. Um, the financial environment, so I work, I work in the NHS and we all know that the financial um, environment is massively constrained, which is code for there is very little money in the NHS. And that does put constraints on delivery and it's a big constraint and challenge on the um, effective implementation of policy. Everyone has to cut their cloth cut their coat according to their cloth and so I think it's really important to remember that there are going to be big constraints on delivery. Um, moving across to the other side we've got things like the end user and representative um, body influences and challenges to policy. I see these as a very very positive element. These are where you actually get the people on the front line saying will this work, won't this work, is this the right thing to do and I think that Without that, you don't get the, the richness that you might otherwise get. In terms of the legal and regulatory constraints, sometimes the, these are the things that actually are the difference between whether a policy can be implemented or can't, and they are things that really have to be borne in mind, and where a particular policy rubs up against some legal or regulatory limitations could see its success or failure. And then the final one is really about... Um, the role of professionals, whether that's professional bodies or individuals in improving policy, contributing their expertise, but also sometimes holding back the development of good policies because organisations or individuals might be captured professionally by what they seek to do, but, but on, on behalf of their whole profession don't feel it's a good thing to, to roll out further. So I think that there are some issues there in terms of, of of influences and challenges at a national level. Locally, 
some pretty similar, some pretty similar challenges. But if you think about pieces of legislation and other policies that um, have been rolled out, and I'm going to talk about two examples of different types of policy making and their implementation, one that's worked from my perspective and one that hasn't worked. But really how things are implemented locally is fundamental. So the context in which something is implemented matters so much. And that, I think, often reflects across to things like what the culture is, what the local influences are, how the, the locality operates, and what local politics is at play. So, you know, what is the position of local councillors? What is the position of stakeholders? What are individual relationships like on a patch? And then how do things like new developments in an area where we've got things like devolution and other, other um, moves that could actually have statutory powers cutting across what is, what is envisaged nationally. So how does that work locally? And then what is the scale of implementation? Because sometimes things that look like they're going to work at a national level or a European level don't actually work as well locally. So the economy of scale you might get in other places doesn't work locally. Have you actually got the capacity and capability to deliver it? Is that a good way of implementing it? And then the final point I would make on this slide is also, what are your local priorities? What are the local financial priorities? Because they can differ from national priorities, and, and that also has to be factored in. Um, I'm going to talk about two examples now. I hope the first one isn't too controversial, but it seems like the um, obvious one to choose in terms of, you know, when when policy making doesn't quite cut it, really. Um, and I think that what we saw with the um, Health and Social Care Act, there's lots and lots of good elements in the so Health and Social Care Act. So it's not actually about the different parts of what sits within the Health and Social Care Act. It's actually how the policy was developed and how it was implemented that actually make the difference there. So um, I think what we saw with the Health and Social Care Act was really um, a lack of effective communication about what the policy was, a lack of presentation around the evidence base that existed for that policy in its totality, which made it very, very tricky for people to say, yes, I get that, that's a good idea because the evidence says X, Y, and Z. Um, there was a lack, I've put professional engagement here, but it, it went broader than that. I think that there was this lack of professional and stakeholder engagement, which, which went alongside the lack of effective communications, which meant that people weren't bought into this policy particularly. Um, this meant that there was actually a big pause in the implement or the, the development of the health and social care legislation, and it changed direction in some areas quite substantially. Now, this might have been a good thing. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment either way in terms of whether it was a good thing to change some substantial elements of that piece of legislation. But what it did mean was that there was a lack of coherence for the policies in there overall. They didn't fit together in the same way. And I think that that is what has had some substantial impact on the outcomes of that piece of legislation and its consequent implementation. I think when we find ourselves in a situation where we are implementing despite the legislation rather than because of, you can start to see that perhaps a piece of policy or pieces of policy aren't quite fit for purpose. Um, in terms of when good policy making does happen, I'm gonna, this isn't tried and tested yet, but I think it's actually quite a good example of when you do actually get those elements coming together. And whether you agree with what the CQC is doing or not is, is neither here nor there, but it's about actually what makes really, really good policy. So as some of you may know, the Care Quality Commission published its five-year strategy yesterday, but this is actually a piece of work that has been at least 18 months in the making. And I've never known an organization go through such thorough engagement and such thorough review and such and to have listened so widely. There's all sorts of things in there that as a sector we don't like. We don't like the fee levels that they're proposing, but they have genuinely listened and they have genuinely set out some robust rationale for what they're doing. So they've built their new strategy on, on a very broad evidence base, 
drawn from their existing inspections and their, their very large um, intelligence gathering exercises. They have engaged so far and wide to the fact that when, when the strategy was actually published yesterday, I did say to a colleague, I thought that had been published months ago because we've seen so much of it and it's been around for so long. And I think it's really, really important that everyone is familiar with this. It's setting out a direction, but everyone's familiar with this policy before it gets anywhere near being published. So my, my third point here is that they did extensive pre-consultation consultation. So when it actually came to it, what they were consulting on really already had some resonance with the people who would be impacted by it. And they took full account of the external environment as well. So, you know, we don't like the fact that they're putting their fee levels up, but what is clearly the case is that there isn't enough money knocking around in the system and that they have had their own budget cut substantially. Therefore, somehow they have to balance the books. And so they have taken, they've, they've created a solution which helps them to do that. So I think that in a sense, you know, even if you don't agree with it, it is a, a good piece of policy making and it, they have set the stage to be able to implement that in a way that is no surprises for the people who will be using it, no surprises for the people who are impacted by it, and a really, really clear rationale for what they are doing. So, fundamentally, um, what I've d taken a really quick canter through there, so I didn't want to talk for too long, but it's just basically to say, you know, there are some really fundamental reasons to love policy, and there are some really fundamental reasons to love good policy, because it does provide that common articulation and that really clear framework for what you are seeking to do. And I think that when people are fully engaged in processes and fully engaged in policy development, and that there is a clear process for feeding back and refining, then it is um, fundamentally a very good thing. So I'm going to stop there and um, hand over. Have a go. It's yours. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak as well. Um, so my name is Abby, I'm Abigail Jackard, um, and I'm actually going to be talking about some of the work that we do at the UK Health Forum. Um, so just to give a bit of background, so the UK Health Forum is made up of 70 organisations and is mainly funded through grants and contracts. And what we primarily focus on at the UK Health Forum is prevention of non-communicable diseases. So we have a policy development and advocacy department, we have an information provision and research department, and we have a modelling and forecasting department. I'm one of the members of the modelling and forecasting department, so that's what I'll be focusing on today. Um, but if you have any other questions, I can ask other colleagues if you send me an email. So, in terms of the modelling department, um, some of the initial work that was done started with the Foresight project, which was a government-funded project um, for looking at, firstly, predicting the rates of, in, of, of, rates of obesity um, into the future and looking at the health impacts and cost impacts of these increasing rates of obesity. So, what actually came out of this was um, a model that was developed to study these different increasing rates. So firstly, we had a model which was made up of two programs. So the first program looks primarily at risk predictions. So I don't have a laser pen, but I'm going to point and try and just... Uh, so it's, it's this module here, which is surrounded by the red dashed line. Um, so that's quite an important module in itself. And then what we do is we predict obesity levels with that model. And then we have a micro-simulation model that allows us to predict the impact of these increasing trends of obesity on health, so incidence, prevalence of NCDs, and costs, and their associated costs. What we can also do is run interventions in the model, so public health interventions or hypothetical scenarios. A micro-simulation, just to give you an overview, because I don't want to get too into the technical de detail, um, is basically where you simulate individuals through time. So these individuals are representative of the country of interest. So for, for example, the UK. So as I said previously, we, we produce predictions. 
So we use um, cross-sectional data sets, um, such as Health Survey for England, to look at obesity. So we use a regression model, so it's just a way of putting in present and past cross-sectional data and being able to predict how the relative sizes of groups, so healthy weight groups, overweight groups, and the obese group are going to change through time. And we do this by age groups and sex groups. And we also produce 95% confidence intervals on these outputs. The program has been developed further since the Foresight project. So we now can model multiple risk, um, many risk factors, such as smoking, salt trends, um, alcohol consumption, physical activity. So, and we're constantly expanding. So it's been developed in a way that can be expanded with relative ease. So these are some examples of the predictions. These are, these are important for inputs into our microsimulation, but our results in themselves. So if you can see the horizontal lines, I'm just going to, these horizontal lines. So these are from our actual cross-sectional survey data. And then the lines, sort of the curves, are actually the trends we predict with our model. Um, so if you can see the red curve on the left graph, which is males 18 to 29 year old in England. Um, the red line shows obesity rates, so BMI over 30. So as you can see, up to 2035, they're increasing. And then we've got the green line showing healthy weight, and that's going down. And overweight is pretty much level until about 2025, where it's starting to dip slightly. And as you can see, this is just to show how important it is to not only um, develop, uh, predict these trends, but also to actually categorize it by age and sex groups. Because if we look at the 80 plus, the actual um, the rate of obesity is much lower. So it's actually increasing at a slower rate. Just to give you an example of smoking, so we also use um, GHS data um, for looking at uh, male and predicting male and female smokers, smoking prevalence. So the blue line shows the prevalence of smokers, and that's decreasing, predicted to decrease over time. And the non-smokers is predicted, inversely, to increase. And this is similar to, for both males and females. This is showing ad all adults. So if I come back to the model, so these are important. We use these as inputs into our model. So our risk factor drives the model forward. What we have then is we have population data that we put in about that country. So for example, England we will put in age sex distributions. So we understand um, how many uh, 20 to 25 year olds there should be in the model, how many, what proportion of 80 plus there should be in the model. We also use disease data. So this, is, this can be changed depending on the project we're looking at. So if we're looking at more cancer-related diseases, so we'll add in more cancers. But in general, we'll include diseases such as type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, and stroke. And all the relevant data relating to prevalence incidence goes into the model. We also include health economic data, because this is important. We include direct healthcare costs, indirect costs if they're available, and social care costs. We then, what's interesting about this model then is we can run it as a no change. So what happens if the trend we predicted does happen? But we can also then implement interventions. So we can run interventions that affect the risk factor or a treatment or a screening of a particular disease. So this is just a, um, this is actually what I've just summarized with all the interventions. And we've currently modeled, we've run models in over 80 countries and 50 US states to date. So this is just as an example, just to show you a typical output that we get from the model in terms of the epidemiology. Um, so we can predict the blue bars show prevalence per 100,000 of cancers and that's all cancers grouped together. The red shows CHD, so coronary heart disease and stroke, and the green showing type 2 diabetes. So this is, we evaluated various different countries and looked at the 
differences in the prevalence rates of these, these diseases. And because we can predict forwards, these are our prevalence rates predicted in 2030. So you can see the countries that really stand out. So UK is quite high and Greece is quite interesting. Um, but what also we can do is just to highlight again is add in intervention. So we can look at what if we decrease the risk by 1%, so decrease the rate of BMI by 1%, or decrease the prevalence of uh, BMI uh, obesity by 5%. So what we can do then is start to compare what sort of impact these public health interventions or hypothetical interventions would have on the rates of diseases. So these are some of the countries that we've modeled in so far. So I thought I'd just summarize briefly some of the projects that we've done in the past. Um, so what we've done is we've done more cost effectiveness analysis on a NICE project, which was looking at uh, managing overweight and obesity among children and young people. We've also more recently done some work with um, Cancer Research UK and looking at um, the predicting the impact of a sugar-sweetened beverage tax on the rates of diseases and costs to the NHS. And we've also looked at um, the rates of smoking and um, various interventions, smoking service interventions associated with reducing the rate of smoking and looking at the impact of that. A more recent European project was a CONDA. Um, so we modeled in eight different European countries and we did the same um, outputs in terms of um, interventions and looking at diseases and costs. But what we also did for this project was we expanded our model. So current in the previous model, we had, for example, type 2 diabetes. So someone in the model either had no disease or they had type 2 diabetes. But we've now added in a pre-diabetic stage, which enables us to then apply a screening or a treatment at that stage or an intervention to have a look at then the impact. Also, what you can download um, if you're interested is as part of that European project, we constructed and built a tool which is a scaled down version of our huge micro simulation model. So our micro simulation model on average will leave running over a weekend to get results. But what this tool is, it's a scaled down version so policymakers can use it simply just to have a look at run experiments with different interventions, but the, the results are produced rapidly, so just in a matter of minutes. So you can look at the impact of various interventions on diseases. And just to finish with some future work that we're now looking at. So previously, we've always looked at one risk factor and multiple diseases and an impact on the risk factor. But what we're actually starting to look at now is combining multiple risks. So in the model, having BMI, smoking, physical activity, all in one model, which as you can see by this diagram, um, it gets more and more complicated in terms of data and interactions, but this is what we're currently working on. So um, I'll keep updated. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Abigail. So now we're going to move into our, our, last, uh, our last session. Um, I think before we sort of start opening up for a wider discussion, I mean, do you want to just uh, respond in any way to what you've just heard, uh, um, Michael? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think, so, so I work for a, a very small team called the NHS European Office, so my colleagues, there's, there's five of us in the team, my colleagues are based in Brussels, and what's really interesting is, therefore, we, we talk to other health systems and health system representatives quite often. So, so when I speak to them, when I come here today, when I hear what's been spoken, the challenges we face are all the same. I think that's the, you know, one of the obvious things we're, we're talking about. But if we get lost on the systems in which we, or within which we work, we struggle to see sometimes how working together can help us achieve our public health uh, focus, our mental health, physical health, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, for me, this is about actually understanding how we can focus on some of the health and care challenges facing us across borders, how we can form partnerships, whether that's EU-funded partnerships or otherwise, and try and understand how we can help models of care develop in this country, which, which 
achieve what we want them to achieve. Ram, you've, uh, you're, at the, you're at the sharp end, and you mentioned to me before we were talking over a coffee that uh, uh, there's a lot of talk, but perhaps not enough action. Do you? Uh, yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things that I would pick up on. Um, one is policy. We obviously can't uh, exist in a policy vacuum, um, but I think the circles that were drawn, you should have drawn little circles for little effect and larger circles with important people that are involved. And from my perspective at the front end, the people that are going to implement this is not the policy makers, not the senior managers, it's people at the coalface. And frankly, for the vast majority of 40 years in the health service, the last people that get asked, what do you think of X, Y, Z policy? Or what do you think the policy ought to be? Are those at the coalface? So I think the weakness, and that's been shown not just by conservative governments, but Labour, Labour, conservative liberals, is that the engagement with the health professionals is at a minimum, and if it's there, it gets ignored. The one time I actually saw it work, policy, was when we had a thing called the NHS Modernisation Agency. I might be very old, but there looks like a few older people here who may have come across that beast, which actually, what they did, they devolved the, uh, the policy making and the implementation to a much more local level. So we had, for instance, in my own specialty, action on ENT. And we did wonderful things for about three, four years before the plug was pulled. I don't know why they pulled the plug, but the plug was pulled. It was ENT, they did stuff on cardiology, mm -hmm. urgent care and stroke, and huge strides were made because it was implemented at that local, local level. So I think policy is all well and good, but the important thing is you need to have a bigger bubble of those that really matter. Well, just, just, just while we're on this, I mean, uh, this issue about Europe, and I'm not going to ask you at the moment anyway about what you think is going to happen uh, uh, next month, but are, are, we, are we ahead of the curve or behind the curve in terms of listening to people at the front line, engaging people, devolving? Obviously, we've heard this morning uh, about how um, initiatives and innovations come from devolution in Wales and we know also in Scotland, but... You know, I mean, are there, is the rest of Europe looking to us and saying, you know what, that, the, the NHS, the way the Brits do it, very impressive, you know, we should be following them? Or is it more us saying, hey, we heard again this morning Finland's doing some interesting stuff, innovation, or the way Italy's doing it, or Spain's doing it, we're, we've got it, we're behind the curve. And where, where, where are we in your opinion, given that you've got this pan-European view of it? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And I think what, one thing I always reflect on is it's very difficult to benchmark within a health system. But actually, when you start hearing others telling you what they perceive your strengths as a health system to be, what an interesting, mm. what an interesting world that opens you up to. And, I, you know, and that's my one wish that everyone could be part of those conversations. So benchmarking across health systems. And, and actually, the thing about the NHS in European terms, our primary care is seen as, as something to hold up for others to aspire to. We're seen as hugely innovative. Mm. Uh, we're seen as a health system people want to work in, which is reflected by the, 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 uh, co you know, the, the composition of our, of our yeah. workforce and where they come from. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have an enormous amount of influence, whether it's on EU law, whether it's on people banging on our doors to say, tell me about NICE, tell me about mm. what you do nationally, tell me about what you do locally. Where we struggle is that how many of us in the health service, hand on heart, talk about what we do well? So how many of us talk outside our trust, our hospital, our area, about what we consider good practice, what we, what we consider uh, what we do well, and how many of us invest in that as a form of quality mm -hmm. improvement? Not enough. And so I can come here and talk about European models of care, which uh, uh, sound really innovative. We know about them because they're talking about yeah, them. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're putting platforms in place to share good practice. So I think there will always be interest in what we do over here, real interest. And I think the difficulty sometimes is trying to match that by, by helping find a good practice and link people up. Catherine, are, are, we, are we just shy or, or, or is that what it is? Is it a British thing? I mean, I mean, you highlighted some good things and also pointed to some rather worrying things about the, the, the system. I mean, the aim is to create a sustainable healthcare system. Are we ahead I of it, uh, the others? I don't, I don't think it's about being shy, actually. <laughs> and I don't think we are shy. I think that probably what we don't do in a way that others do is bring it all together to showcase it. But my sense is that we are as equally involved in 
in the networks, in the forums, showing what we're doing as, as other countries in the EU are. I mean, Michael's better placed than me to ask that. But I think that there is a whole host of innovation going on. There's a whole host of really good practice. And I think, I think people are um, parading that in, in different contexts. I think perhaps what we don't do as much of is actually to um, bring to life for people. So I think that the NHS is beloved wherever you turn in terms of what it delivers and what it offers. I wonder if we actually scratch beneath the surface and say, what is it about that NHS that we love that, that then actually stacks that up? Because we know it's the case and we know people do, but I don't think we give that many specifics underneath that. I think I think when, when we're faced with, with the situation where something might go, then people understand how much they like it. Um, but I'm not sure that we're that good, and you know, it's a criticism my organisation and others really in terms of you know, how much do we put out there about what's brilliant about the NHS. It does happen in some quarters, but it, it, it's not as much as it could be. But on the, on just on that, I mean, some of the polling work, I'm sure some of you have seen it, uh, public attitudes towards the NHS, towards healthcare as a whole, often comes through the, the prism of your local hospital. I'm trying yeah. to have a dialogue with people about maybe we should put in more resources as we discussed here into public health, you know, early intervention, and, you know, very impressive contributions yeah. we heard today about first thousand days and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, are we missing a trick here? Because, you know, we can march to defend our local hospital, but perhaps knowing that mm, in terms of the limited resources we have, that might not perhaps be the well, best absolutely. way of doing it. I mean, you I policy makers have got job to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a massive loyalty and identification with the bricks and mortar of, of the health service. So your, your local hospital being one of those, but I think actually often the services and the services that are run from them are very valued, but often the services that people are in most contact with are actually more local than their local yeah. hospital. So it is about local GPs, health visitors, midwives, etc, mm -hmm. etc. And, and there is uh, a difficult conversation to be had around that because actually it is about how do we how do we prioritize those services how do we make sure that that prevention is happening and how do you how do you over time shift investment to prevention rather than just focusing on on treatment and which needs to happen of course as well I'm not saying it's one or the other but you know how do you gradually shift that focus and that prioritization onto things that people don't necessarily see as being as mm -hmm. tangible so disinvestment in one service the benefit of another is, is challenging and tricky and it's it's always the conversation around in the run-up to a general election you can guarantee that the keep my local A&E open yeah. Um, campaigners will be everywhere where it's likely that one's going to be closed, even if replacing that with an urgent care, walk-in urgent care centre may well be absolutely the right thing to do. So it's really tricky. Abby, are, we, are we just measuring the wrong thing then? Are we, are you think in some ways in the metrics that you're, you're talking about, I mean, how do, we, how do we get to measure that? that I mean, certainly on early interventions, prevention, the, the whole holistic outcomes bit, which is what we need to communicate to uh, to the public or also uh, voters, uh, that that's where the, the focus should be. Yeah, I definitely think communicating prevention to this. So with our recent Cancer Research UK project, that was actually um, very widely publicised, and which was very good in terms of the sugar sweetened beverage tax. And when you start to, you know, I'm coming from a modelling side and not from working directly within um, the healthcare system. So you can see that when you add these interventions, the effect it has in terms of cost savings and healthcare savings. So I, I definitely think, you know, there is, you know, I, I work on more on prevention, but there is scope to sort of expand models and to look at, you know, larger scale models where you're looking at um, the use of a service um, and trying to allocate that and trying to get the, you know, models are used to sort of as a test case, just to kind of, you yep. know, turn a few, put on a few buttons, turn a few knobs, just to see what the most effective way of running a system is at the end of the day, so. And Raman, you, you talk to me about, you know, what's happening with consultants and at the top end of their professions. I mean, are they buying into the sort of discussions that we're having? Your, your colleagues? <laughs> Not really. Um, well, some are. 
But the point I want to make is actually there are a lot of brilliant ideas out in the health service. I'm sure there are truckloads of, within the audience. One of the big issues that I've had over the last two, three decades is actually getting into a, a platform where you can actually get your idea over to those that are making policy or implementation. Because generally what you, ha what you get is you may go to a PCT or an CCG, you meet the janitor, you're talking to the janitor for about six months, he leaves and then you meet another janitor, and then finally you get to a low-level manager, and it's about three years have gone by. Now, I tend to persist, but most people would give up. So it's taken me three decades to actually initiate two projects, which have worked very well. Now, I'm one of tens of thousands of people who've got very good ideas. There ought to be some sort of mechanism at a local level that says, we have got five million quid, <laughs> we want projects from you local people, and this five, five million quid will help, you know, initiate and implement one or more of those projects. We don't want the government telling us what to do, okay, because generally they don't know. We don't want the big policy makers out there telling us what to do, because generally they don't know. We know what's required. Innovation comes from people like you and me. It never comes from uh, national government. They may set a framework, but all the implementation, how you put it into effect, comes from people like you and me. So we need, uh, we need a forum where people like nurses, people like doctors, physiotherapists, occupational therapists can say, I've got a great idea, and I saw this in action not just from my perspective, but about uh, three weeks ago we had a meeting, the first one in about five years, of consultants and GPs in Hillingdon, Harrow and Brent, which is my sort of three CCGs. And we had some national policy-making people come along, so everybody fell asleep. Then when the three, when the three people who had initiated local projects got up and spoke, everybody sat up and listened. And the fundamental theme in these three projects was the damn hard work that these people had in getting the project through with little support from the CCG or anybody else. There were three or four people in each project working against the tide, making it succeed, and now suddenly everybody wants a part of it. But actually there was no support at that level. So instead of something taking three, four years, it could have taken six or 12 months and then disseminated. So we need some sort of mechanism where there are some fun, funds that are very local, very focused, that enable us to take innovation forward. Otherwise you just get tired and within 10 years you say, oh, I can't be bothered. Shall we open this up? Uh, let's, have some, let's have some questions to, to people and uh, uh, let's have a, more of a discussion. Yeah, gentlemen there. Just say who you are, yeah, so, we, so we know, just in case. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm John Rodriguez. I'm a public health consultant and I'm the screening and immunisation lead for Kent. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, if the panel will indulge me. Sure. Um, the first is uh, for Abby, uh, or about Abby's presentation. But thank you, it was excellent, really clear. Um, it could be a very confusing subject, but it, it wasn't, uh, thank you. Um, I was looking at your graphs and I was thinking, uh, go towards the right-hand side. I wonder if I'll still be alive at that point. And um, then I thought, well, this is looking at it from a, a kind of cohort, uh, not from a cohort point of view, from a sort of cross-sectional point of view of, of uh, the people who are a, a particular age at a certain point in time. And we talked earlier about making things, um, looking at things from different viewpoints, from the point of view of the individual patient. Um, and in this case, we're looking at it from the point of view of policymakers and government. And it would be nice to see um, what the life course might be of a group of 18 to 25 year olds projected forward if they did nothing, what would their risks be? And stick it into your multi-model as well, that would be quite, quite fun. And I know there are risk calculators for individuals that are used in general practice and other, other places. We should do a version of that, but um, I think you could, you, I think you've got, probably got the statistical power to look at it from an, um, the point of view of an individual or a group of people looking forward in their life course, and I, th I think that would be great. Um, I think my other comment about um, when you started off, you said, oh, we're looking at the non-communicable diseases. 
maybe we ought to rename them, call them socially communicable, something like that. I think that would uh, frame the, uh, the thing slightly better, a bit like calling uh, road accidents road crashes. Um, my, my second uh, uh, angle was um, about policy. And I listened with interest to uh, Sakharin's presentation about making good policy, etc. And earlier on this morning, um, to the uh, Welsh presentation about some of the very excellent practical results of their, of their policy. And uh, I, I thought about it then, and I saw people taking uh, photographs of the, of the screen and how excellent it was, but I thought, how, how long is this going to take? And here I'm with Ram about the time taken to do things. It drives you nuts. If you look at the CQC thing, they've taken 18 months to do a five-year policy, so they use 30% of the time just making the policy, and then we've got implementation. And we do things in slow motion. What are the actual costs associated with taking a long time to do policy versus the extra cost of doing it quickly? If you try and communicate to the same extent with groups of people to consult widely, but do it quickly, you've got to get into their diaries. So you've almost got a, like a physics entropy problem, getting people together, fighting the entropy, takes a lot of energy. Um, is it worth it? There's an economic cost in making policy that we haven't talked about and how quickly to do it. And time has not been talked about. Okay, well, that was a very two uh, challenging questions. I think we'll just take those. <laughs> um, so Abby, you, you, yes. you respond first in the cohorts. I'm very interested That's in kids' age, so go ahead, tell me. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of our model, we're actually developing it so we can look at cohorts at the moment. But um, as I, I didn't want to go too much into the tool because I didn't have that much time. But um, if you download the tool, you can actually run cohorts of individuals through time. Um, so you, for either um, looking at your risk factor, obesity, or smoking, so you can run, um, I think we do 20-year groups, so 20 to 39, and then uh, upwards. So you can actually download it and have a look at that. It's not a problem at all, but we do run it, yeah. Saffron, policy, why yeah. did it take so long? Um, <laughs> well, I'm not going to be um, an apologist or otherwise for the Sorry. CQC strategy and how long they took to do that, but I would say that there are also dangers in doing it too fast and I think you do have to strike a balance and I think that um, you know there is something about making sure that you raise awareness of what's being done as you go through the process of actually developing the policy because I think things that come out of the blue are the things that really really irritate people um, I think engaging people as you go along is very very important which is what I think the CQC did, yes, they have spent a long time developing it, but um, the strategy will now be rolled out over the next five years, and they've done the, the pre-consultation work and the, the consultation in parallel with, obviously, delivering their day job. Um, I think that perhaps they could have done it more speedily, but I think that a lot is lost in the process if you do it too fast. So, um, policy development does take time, it does cost, but um, I think if you don't do it properly, it, it works out more expensive in the end because you spend a long time undoing what you've just put into place. So my sense is I'd rather be thorough in the preparation than thorough in the cleanup. Very good, very good. Let's take some questions. Yes. Hi. Um, Am I introducing myself? Yeah. My name is Anushka. I, I, I manage a team in, in Camden, actually, but I work for a, a mental health trust, um, and we work in crisis mental health. I suppose it's a couple of observations, really, and, and just as a thank you for the day. It's, it's been really interesting to see some of the, the conversations about innovation, especially thinking about digital health care, um, which was one of the main reasons why I came, certainly, and I, I think it was obviously quite an, an, a, a popular, popular topic. Um, it's kind of, I suppose it's just to sort of... A, a, to kind of agree with some of the points you were making about how we don't really celebrate some of the good things we do but really within that just to kind of identify that that there seems to be a lot of people with lots of good intentions and actually make doing some really good um silo kind of projects but there's not really a good way of having an innovation lead so i just wondered whether any of you had any suggestions of how we could be a little bit better at networking in our sort of communities and sort of identifying right okay you're, you're doing this piece of work you're doing this piece of work 
how, how can we work together to try and make that a bigger piece of work rather than having lots of different people all kind of doing similar things, um, wasting a lot of each other's time and then ultimately coming, to, uh, ultimately coming up with lots of different projects that kind of all overlap because that's something that I see constantly in our area. They're like loads of, and it's, all, it's always with good intention, but it, it's really infuriating when you start to network and you speak to different people and realize, okay, all of you are basically doing the same thing. <laughs> Why don't you sit down in a room and have a conversation about it? So I suppose my question was to anyone in the room or to any of you guys, how, how mm. do you think that we could make that? It's a good, it's a good question, actually, because uh, my, my, my sister's a nurse practitioner, and she was saying the same thing. That when that first started, very you know, 20 years ago, when she started uh, one of the first uh, group of people to, to go into nursing, into nurse practitioner work, the silos between uh, the doctors, the GPs, and... And, and the nurses was, were so rigid, the walls were so thick that it wasn't even possible to communicate. Whereas now, you know, beginning to sort of see where they can both work together and creating forums where they can talk uh, and communicate so they can advance that. And are we seeing something similar elsewhere in Europe or are we, again, special in this that we've got a particular problem that we don't seem to be able to talk to each other? I think what, from a European perspective, I think what I would say is wherever you work, whatever sector you work in, whatever your role is, you will have representation in and around Brussels. So there will be a mental health grouping at the European level. There will be public health, there will be patient representatives, there will be healthcare scientists, there will be peer groups of clinicians, there will be the royal colleges, there will be the regulators. So actually, if you wanted to look at how, for example, European funding is bringing partnerships together, if you wanted to look at how conferencing like this works across borders, if you wanted to look out who is a member of a mental health Europe organization from uh, Spain or France. Th these things all exist, I think, is about awareness and about trying to direct people to them. So, so I mean, if you want to catch me at the end, I can point you in a, point you in a few of these ways. But, you know, th this conversation will be happening in other countries. And, and the, the advantage of, of, of working in and through Brussels is it's an obvious meeting place. So whether or not this is an official European Union platform, People are in Brussels because they know other health systems and other peers are there. So there will be, undoubtedly, whatever your function, there will be a representative umbrella that exists in Europe, and part of its role will be to bring people together. It might have a role, it wants to change EU policy, it might want to raise clinical standards, it might want to get new innovations through to market. It will have many different functions, but fundamentally it will be a, a meeting of peers. Very good. And there's, there's a lady there who wanted to ask a question. Yeah, you can. Yeah. I just add yeah. one thing on how you disseminate this stuff. Uh, I gave an example earlier on about the action on as part of the NHS Modernization Agency, where good practice was created within specialties. I know that the government probably ho hates professional organizations because they don't normally agree with what they want to do. Prof but professional organizations, they may be a bit single minded, but generally speaking, they have the best interest of the patients and improved care as their fundamental remit. And I think what you need to do is have a better mechanism for specialty organizations to talk to one another. So in my own specialty of ENT, we have very close relations with speech and language therapists, for example, okay? And we have a lot of fora where we would discuss common problems. We have other fora that discuss with the respiratory colleagues because they're all messing around in the airway together, you know, beating, up, beating each other up about it. But, you know, we try and communicate that way. So I think it's at your specialty level that you need to go, okay? If you try and do it through CCGs, it won't work. We have two or three very good projects. You go to an adjacent CCG and they want you to start from the basement and go through the whole rigmarole that you've gone with the adjacent CCG before they'll even look at the project. It's nuts, <laughs> complete nuts. <laughs> Very good, yes. You've got the microphone. Yeah, hi. Um, we're coming fast to the end of the day, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for a, a really in, inspirational day. Um, just a few comments. Um, Professor Dillon um, really liked your approach of um, making change happen or putting innovation into practice um, at a local level. And you're absolutely right, innovation is created by people like us, all of us here. And um, I think it would be great if, if what you've actually suggested could, 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 could actually happen. 
just wanted to make one observation around um, long-term conditions and the preventative work around long-term conditions. There are a lot of elements of um, interventions that work across the, the whole of the spectrum of the long-term conditions, mainly diet and lifestyle, um, exercise habits, and other um, smoking and, and drinking habits. Um, so I don't know why we just focus on single, um, so much on uh, single um, conditions, rather than actually looking at the whole spectrum and may, may, making focus of lifestyle changes to improve people's um, health from the outset as, as the way forward, rather than actually sort of uh, labeling different things, um, because I think the benefits are huge. And you know, given the cost um, uh, restrictions or uh, within the NHS, I think it will be huge value for money taking that approach. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Safran, I'm just going to bring you in on this, this, this issue. Of, I mean, I've just touched it before about the public attitudes. I mean, how much more do we have to do to get the public to understand that it's a much better, sensible, wiser way to go about things is to try and prevent illness rather than treating it? I mean, in the policy terms, we're pushing, pushing, pushing hard, but, you know, uh, just, it's frustrating. I mean, you, you, it seems that, I mean, is it just, just going to take time, as I said, things just take time? Or is there something we're missing here? Do we need to... Well, I think there are two things. One which does take time, which is the gradual awareness raising, because, you know, it just does. You know, incrementally awareness of these things will build and different programmes and different initiatives will help to support that. And if you think about, you know, the really obvious ones, but mindset changes about things like smoking, you know, they happen over time, gradually, gradually, gradually. So that's one thing. I think... The other thing I would say is that how do we change attitudes? Well, I think it's also about, sometimes it's about changing the attitudes of those who are closest to people in their community. So if we are thinking about changing the nature of how we deliver services, then having local councillors who are supportive of what's going on and able to explain the benefits, having local MPs who think maybe beyond the closing of the A&E department or whatever it is and thinking slightly more broadly about what does that mean, you know, for the overall benefit of my area rather than what does it mean for how someone might vote for me in the next election. I'm, it's all understandable stuff, but um, it, I think there is something about the responsibility of those locally who have a voice, who speak on behalf of others and who can also influence others. So I think there's one which is general, um, the general models of behaviour change and so incremental messaging and all of that kind of thing. The other is about, you know, people stepping forward and saying, I locally am known and I, I support this particular change because we, we do see that and we often see it, but we don't see it everywhere. Ram, are we making it too complicated? <laughs> uh, to me, it's pretty straightforward. I'm not sure how much the government spends on you know, give up smoking, do more exercise and all the rest of it, but it's a fraction of what Nestle may spend on eat more chocolate or McDonald's eat more junk food. I mean, the thing is completely out of kilter. They spend that amount of money, we have about two and sixpence in the old currency, so it's about 5p now. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's crackers, and what they get is they want to have GPs who've got five minutes, seven minutes, or ten minutes, possibly, to not only... Uh, understand what the patient's primary problem is, but also give them lifestyle counselling. It's complete nuts. It's not going to happen. And even though they may have spent 10 million, 100 million, 250 million pounds, we're still fat. We still don't exercise. So it ain't working. So I don't think more of the same is just nonsense, okay? They have to politically, if the government wants a policy, actually look at some of this stuff that they know. We know smoking, when people stop smoking, the illnesses go down. They need to be much more aggressive with companies that sell this stuff, okay? And food, same thing, but they won't do it. It takes months, years, or never. So my feeling is that they've given us a poison chalice, which we're not going to succeed at. This is, a, this is one of the things where they ought to have policy and aggressive policy, okay? And unless they do that, we'll be talking like this again in about 10 or 15 years. And this is something the EU should also, I, about, I, I think, help as well. Yeah.
given that we're hopefully, my view anyway, uh, will still be in the EU, I mean, are, are we looking for more well, regulation? Remain. <laughs> <laughs> Very straightforward. Are we, are we looking for tighter, I mean, you know, in some ways, we, we, it's coming, isn't it? I mean, the, 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 the love affair between the politicians and the corporates seems to be fading a bit. More. Other issues are getting in the way, tax, and we're starting to begin to not have a, the trust things disappearing. I mean, are we, are we at a nice point where we can start to tighten the regulation on some of this? I mean, the, the one example I would use, which is quite recent, is tobacco products directive. Yeah. Uh, and that was in incredibly challenging for the politicians in Brussels. Uh, you know, and, and the money which the industry spent lobbying was, was eye-watering. Yeah. And actually, the main reason why the tobacco industry collectively spent so much was because the US regulators were monitoring. And the US regulators wanted to reflect European agreements. So you are talking... You are talking not far shy of a billion euros spent by industry trying to knock out EU regulation. So, and, 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 and actually, this shows the challenge, I think, of also to the public health lobby and, and to all of those that, you know, <laughs> there are going to be people in favour and opposed to regulation. Regulation is probably the hardest thing to do. Research funding or other forms of funding is the easiest, maybe an informal agreement, maybe, you know, maybe a parliamentary report. Legislation is the end point in that mm -hmm. sense. And Tobacco Products Directive was passed. Of course, there were a few variations from where it's set off because they were up against the election, which, again, colleagues were trying to take it past the election so that it would be, so that it would be, would be knocked out of place. But actually, the 